Hey everyone, how's it going? Hope you're all doing great, as I always say, following the three H's of the channel and all that good stuff. And in this video, I got some really, really weird and strange stuff. Also scary, but emphasis on the weird. So, if that sounds like something you're interested in, definitely pull up a sump with me and let's get into it. Thank you for watching. I live in and around the Wicklow Mountains. There are tons of ghost stories and many legends that I was told growing up, i.e. a banshee. There is a creepy woods nearby that's called the Devil's Glen. I don't really know how I got the name, but it's a nice nature walk. But at night, some really strange stuff goes down, like occult stuff. A girl was kidnapped and tied to a tree and assaulted, but survived. There are random structures everywhere all throughout the woods that nobody knows what they mean. Anyway, the scary thing that happened to me isn't totally related to the Devil's Glen, but to the mountain area. The only thing that happened to me was I used to stay up late when I was between 14 and 16 years old. Late, for me, being about 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. One night, I was watching TV when something knocked on our sitting room window. Three knocks. I freaked out and bolted upstairs and looked out my bedroom window. There was nobody there. It took me about five seconds to get to the window. Nobody on the road. Nobody behind my house. I looked out the landing window as well. I turned everything off and went straight to bed. Which, this turned out to be a very big mistake. Apparently, it was a banshee. She knocks on your front door or window, and you have to open the front door and the back door so she can pass through the house peacefully. Or else, someone you love will die very soon. I didn't do that, and one week later, my godmother, my parents' best friend who lived three doors away, died mysteriously. She was only 46. This happened when I was younger. I was riding a bike with my mother and my sister in front of me. It was a five kilometer trip through the forest to the lake that we were going to. I'm not really in good shape at this point in time, kind of chubby, so I can't keep up after them. My glasses are broken, so I ride without them. I can see my mom 200 meters in front of me as her dress. It looks like a red stain to me, of course. She stops and turns left between the trees. This isn't a big deal because she does this all the time. She likes to pick the blueberries. I decide to help her. I drive to the point that she turned left and I do the same. I start going deeper and deeper into the woods, farther away from the main trail. I'm still seeing my mom the same distance in front of me. I get nervous. I shout after her to slow down because I can't keep up. There's no response. Suddenly, I hear my sister yelling after me. What are you doing, idiot? Where are you going? She stands in the exact opposite direction that I thought the road was. I look again. The red dot that I thought was my mom is nowhere to be seen. My mom was still on the road and sent my sister after me when she saw me entering the forest. I honestly don't know what would have happened to me if my mother did not turn around to see where I was and see that I was gone. I've told this before to a good number of people, but... I still don't know what happened. I saw something that was either a wendigo or similar to one. I was probably 
maybe 11 years old, living in the Appalachian mountain range. I'll just say that it was in the tri-state area of West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. I wasn't even that deep in the woods when this happened, honestly. Maybe 250 yards into the woods away from my neighborhood. I was playing with my brother and my other friend. We had a little tree fort that was set up on the side of a hill overlooking an old field that used to be used for farming. This field was a little larger than a football field, and we were positioned near the end zone. My brother and my friend were in the fort. I was standing outside of the fort, looking down into the field. I remember suddenly catching movement in my peripheral vision, what looked like a white blur. When I focused on it, it looked like a really tall, pale, ghostly white person that was hunched over and sprinting across the field. Their running form was so over-exaggerated that it creeped me out. It was sort of pumping its arms in front of itself with each stride. Just really weird. It didn't look anything like how a human sprints. Anyways, it was on a path across the field horizontally from my position, and it must have crossed the field in two seconds or less. I've never seen anyone sprint that fast in my life. It was hard to believe. On the other side of the field was a creek, and then another hill. This thing effortlessly jumped over the creek, and then grabbed a thick branch in midair, and disappeared into the woods. It must have jumped at least 35 feet, and maybe even 20 feet high. This thing was pale in appearance. It almost shined in certain areas when the light would hit it. I don't believe there was any fur on it anywhere. It looked just like pale, ghostly white skin all over. Its arms and legs were noticeably longer than that of a human's. It was extremely slender in its build. I never got a good look at its face due to the angle at which it was running, but I assume that it had one. It had a sort of human-shaped head, after all. I'd estimate the height to be about 6'6 six, six or so, maybe taller, maybe shorter, given a couple inches. For a little bit, I kind of thought that this was a hallucination of some kind, but I was watching it manipulate the environment around it. The tall grass it ran through noticeably shimmered when it passed through it. I remember seeing it shake out a bunch of leaves when it grabbed the tree branch. You could tell the thing put a lot of force on that branch when it grabbed it. The leaves just started tumbling down in that specific spot. When I was watching it, I was completely frozen in fear. My body locked up, and my adrenaline was off the charts. Once it left my field of view, my body started working again, and I sprinted back into the neighborhood. My friends never believed me, obviously, and I've never brought it up with anyone in real life because I know how this story sounds. It's so frustrating having an experience like this. You have no way of knowing if what it was you saw, if it was a hallucination, or you're just losing your mind, or if it was totally real. Honestly, I wish I never saw it. I felt like I was going to die, and I still don't know what it was. Why did it even show itself? It could have easily stayed hidden if it wanted. It seemed very intelligent. This was sent in to me by Mutant Buzzard, so I hope I can do your story justice. This story has been told many times by many people, but this is most likely the first and only time an eyewitness story has been submitted to any paranormal stories forum. The backstory starts when my brother married a tough-as-nails Cuban beauty named Mary. 
All four of my sister-in-law Mary's grandparents were Cuban people who crossed 90 miles of open sea on rafts cobbled together from anything that would float. Inner tubes, empty buckets, garbage, and the like. Mary was the second youngest of nine siblings, and she was the only girl. She and her family lived in a barrio on the outskirts of Little Havana, where Mary and her family lived in a single wide trailer on a quarter acre in a subdivision surrounded by canals and marshy forests. This is where she and her brothers and their friends spent many happy days catching turtles, frogs, snakes, and fish, and obviously always keeping an eye out for gators. Whenever a gator was spotted, the men would get a nuisance gator tag, and then they would have gator barbecue. Good times. We couldn't have a gator around our rural area eating someone's dog or chicken or goat or pig or kids, all of which were plentiful in Mady's Barrio. The majority of the other lots were in the various stages of occupation many with the remains of flooded or burned out trailers and abandoned construction interspaced with vacant lots and the occasional Cuban expat neighbor living the American dream. There were some hard times too. Sadly, the drug wars of the 80s and 90s claimed Mary's oldest brother in a shootout, and her second oldest brother was doing life in prison for taking revenge on his brother's killer. Being the only girl, Mary's indulgent father was especially watchful of his only daughter, named after his own sainted mother. All of Mary's brothers were overly protective of their little sister, too. One of Mary's neighbors that looms large in Mary's story was the crazy catwoman who lived in the corner lot of the crushed seashell road. This road ended at the canal of a marshy forest, this crazy cat lady, who was rumored to be a bruja, a witch, she dabbled in the dark arts, tarot card reading, voodoo, and the like. Not someone you wanted to be on the bad side of, anyways. In addition to a dozen or so cats, the crazy voodoo lady also had two large, black, Great Dane dogs that barked a lot, and Mary's parents told her and her siblings to steer clear of the bruja, so she and her brothers did not want to get bit. The summer I turned ten, Mary recounted. We had a new neighbor move in on our street, at the swampy end of the road, not the last lot, but right next to the last lot. This old Texas redneck moved in with a beat-up fifth-wheel camper, with an even older one-ton flatbed diesel 4x4 Ford pickup. A World War II era BMW motorcycle with a sidecar. That was our new neighbor, Carl's pride and joy, as well as a custom Volkswagen convertible bug that had been that had been bahad with a Rolls Royce hood and some three wheeled ATCs referred to as swamp buggies and an airboat. Rumors swirled about the new neighbor, Mary continued. Some true. He was a combat vet with an honorable discharge, and he was a ex-felon, and a lot of rumors weren't true, that he was a neo-Nazi and a Klan member. What Carl was, was an avid war reenactor, and a member of the Civil War reenactor group called Sons of the South. One of the prerequisites for membership in this group, the Sons of the South, was that you had to have an ancestor that fought for the South in the Civil War, Another prerequisite was to drink beer and smoke a lot of dope. Trouble started between Carl and our crazy cat lady, Corinne, right away when her favorite cat got run over, and right or wrong, she blamed Carl. For his part, Carl barely acknowledged her existence, and she didn't like that at all. Up until Carl moved in, the entire barrio was very differential toward the crazy cat lady, who diagnosed and cured hexes, as well as casting hexes, on those who didn't pay homage to her. Those who did pay, paid in gifts of cash, food, coffee, rum, tobacco. But not Carl, 
whose vehicles all had exhaust cutout valves installed to be as quiet as possible when he was poaching, and at least twice as loud as her big dogs barking. Pretty much the loud pipes were how Carl acknowledged crazy cat lady Corinne to the point where she called the cops on him more than once, only for the police to explain that noise ordinance started at 10 on weeknights and midnight on weekends. So by the time the cops arrived, the only thing breaking noise laws were her dogs. Carl constantly got the better of Corinne, who now claimed Carl was killing her cats to use as gator bait, and we would also occasionally hear a gunfight up Carl's way, late at night. The sheriff investigated Carl, who, because of his felonous past, was not allowed to own a gun. What he could have were working replicas of Civil War arms and black powder rifles and the like. This feud went on for years, with our parents telling us kids to stay clear of both of them, with my father occasionally helping the crazy cat lady out with groceries, which I later learned, which I later learned were nothing short of blackmail payments that my father was paying to protect his precious Ida. It was the summer that I turned 13, Mary continued, my last year of tomboy foolery as my keen Sarah was fast approaching my 14th birthday. That would mean that I would have to learn to be a lady. I was with my brothers and cousins when things started to get really weird that summer, as a rumor that a monster had been conjured up by the witch to deal with Carl. The monster had been seen, heard, and smelled frequently, and hardly a night went by without the sound of gunfire drowning the night sounds of rural Florida. Some people included one of my brothers, Pablo, claimed to have seen something weird. But then some of the kids decided that we were going to have a hunt with this monster, and we armed ourselves with frog geeks, spear guns, machetes, long knives, and makeshift clubs. We were all pendejos, but we had a ball that summer hunting monsters, that is, until we found one. One morning, after an early quiet night, we were disturbed by the witch yelling curses at Carl for trying to kill her dog, and this time, she was right. There was a blood trail leading from Carl's place to the witch's, lots of blood crimson on the crushed white shell road attracting flies. My father called the sheriff for the distraught woman and a couple of deputies, came out to investigate, only to find a badly injured, giant dog barely breathing in the crazy lady's fenced yard. The deputies had no problem backtracking the dog's trail to Carl's. After talking to Carl, the deputies came back to tell the witch that it seemed that her dog had attacked Carl at his place, and then staggered home, wounded. Trying to keep the peace, my father offered to pay the vet bill, even though it would be a financial strain on our family. Sadly, the crazy voodoo bruja was inconsolable and only calmed down when the deputies threatened to charge her with some kind of dangerous dog off the leash or something like that. But it worked. She calmed down once the vet showed up to treat the injured dog. The vet said it looked like the dog had been stabbed with some kind of curved sword but the animal would most likely recover. The next day, we had been out in the canals all afternoon, hunting monsters and finding turtles and frogs until the sun went down. We heard something grunting, like a hog, only way bigger. Then we saw something big and black, crashing through the boonies, charging us, so we ran, and everyone was out running me. I was so scared wondering where my brothers were. I made the mistake of thinking that once I was on the white crushed seashell road that I was safe, so I slowed down to catch my breath, only to feel a prickling awful smell on the back of my neck. Then I was torn asunder by what I later learned was a boar's tusk, tearing bone-deep lacerations up into my back ribcage.
I was sure that I would be eaten by a monster until I was rescued by Carl, who forced his way in between me and the monster by stabbing it in the throat with a bayonet on what I learned later was a working replica of a rifled musket from the Civil War era. I still remember with crystal clarity Carl holding the gun with both hands, nearly lifting the monster off the ground as it grasped futilely at the sharpened steel protruding from its gullet. Then Carl insulted the monster. You bucked up Bendejo, he called it. Then pulled the muzzle maybe an inch or two away from the monster's neck and pulled the trigger, blowing the monster's brains out the back of its head. Then, Carl looked at me and said, Vamu Seta, which means beat it, kid, and Sarah Tsubaka, and keep your mouth shut. So I got up and ran to catch up with my brothers, who all saw all the blood, and then my father took me to the hospital, where I got this cool scar. Mary showed us the gnarly mark on her back, and it was a doozy of a scar. My father scooped me up and rushed me to the hospital, where they stitched me up, and they discharged us early in the morning. They had given me some medicine for the pain, and that helped, but I was still too wired to sleep. My brother told me that Carl had drugged the dead monster into his fenced backyard with his garden tractor before any of us brave monster hunters could muster the nerve to poke at it. All that was left was a blood stain and some flies. My father didn't sleep either, and everyone wanted to see my wound until we smelled and heard Carl wake and baking late in the morning when my father took me by the hand and looked at the tracks and blood before we knocked on Carl's door. I saw what my father saw, namely a split hoof print as big as his fists. Carl greeted us. Hey Minnow, glad to know that you're going to be okay been trying to get that thing for damn near a month now, when all I needed to find was the right bait. Carl winked at me, and my father almost laughed, and then, with his voice thick and slow with emotion, Papa said, you saved my Ata's life. Sorry about that, Carl said with mock seriousness, it wasn't my intention. My Papa said sincerely, gracias mi amigo and then laughed and cried at the same time, wiping a tear of gratitude with his callous knuckle away. So, did you have to get stitches? Carl asked, slightly changing the subject. As I showed him my back, Carl whistled in appreciation. Yup, that's a beaut. You pay attention to it, Minnow. When it itches or tickles, it won't lead you wrong. Carl showed us a vivid scar on the back of his hand, indicating how he knew from experience. Then Carl asked, You want to see it? Mary pleaded, and he said, Meet me at the side gate. Carl closed his front door, and then a minute or so later, he led us into his backyard, Mary continued. Carl led us into the backyard, and my father paled at what he saw. Before us, hanging by its heels from a chinaberry tree, was the beast that attacked me. Flies buzzed around a reeking gut pile that had been eviscerated from the huge creature, obviously a male humanoid body, but much larger. Its body was covered with hog-like bristles that really grossed Mary out. And the beast's head, or what was left of it, also resembled a hog. That's what a 69 caliber buck and ball will do to you if you let it. Carl then explained that that was what he had killed the Hogman with when he saw me looking at the ghastly wound on the monster's head, or rather what had been. In addition to the size and smell, what stood out the most were the hog monster's hands that had strange pincer-like hoof hands with four hoof-tipped digits. It had a baby gator and a snake and some seeds in its stomach. Carl poked the gut pile with a long cavalry saber. Tell you what, Minnow, you can bring your friends by and have a peek for five dollars, and we'll split the take. New spread, muy pronto, in the barrio, and everyone wanted to see the monster, and some even had cameras and took photos, and I was raking in the dinero, Mary continued. 
Carl's Civil War reenactor buddies started to show up with campers, swamp buggies, and tracking dogs. They all paid to see the monster with a big grin that disappeared right after actually viewing it, hanging from the chinaberry tree. Then they set up barbecues, coolers of beer, and folding chairs when the sheriff and his two biggest deputies pulled up at my casa to talk to my father about my injuries. The four of them slowly walked up to Carl's place, where my father showed them my wound, and they were all duly impressed. I said it's five dollars each if you want to see the monster, I informed the cops, when Carl said, no charge for our men in blue minnow, but the sheriff shot him a dirty look as he fished out of his wallet and paid full price for himself and his deputies, who also paled at the sight and smell of the monster. Then my father, Carl, the sheriff, and one of Carl's Civil War reenacting friends that everyone just called Colonel, got into an argument over what was to be done, and it was finally decided in favor of Carl's plan. After he agreed to let any of the Cuban expats that wanted to join in the search, they could, and the sheriff acquiesced mostly because he couldn't really stop them. Once that was decided, the sun was setting and the colonel told everyone to stay sober and be ready to march at dawn. The colonel made his rounds, inspecting everyone's gear as he spoke solemn encouragement to his men. They were ready to attack at dawn. That night, Curl produced the hog monster's heart that he had cooked on his barbecue, thinly sliced and diced, and everyone that wanted to try it could have a bite. My father partook, as did I, and we were eating, and there was this horrible, blood-curling scream that came from the witch's casa. Mary shivered at the memory. Other than a small tiff between my mother and father, got into over his honor, demanding that he take part in the hunt, and that there would be no more protection money paid to the Bruja. My father believed, as others did, that the Bruja had summoned these creatures to harass Carl. The tension-filled night passed uneventfully, Dawn cracked loud and early to the sounds of swamp buggies and fan boats going through their final checklists before heading into the boonies. My father had his old revolver as well as a sturdy frog gig and joined the others as they headed out. The sheriff and his two biggest deputies were there too, as well as an ambulance and two fishing game wardens that all stayed at the staging area while the Cuban expats and the Civil War reenactors marched, or rather boated, and rode swamp buggies into the bush. More than once that day, we heard the staccato ripping sound of gunfire, and before the day was over, they had to take two people to the ER. One had a heat stroke, and the other tripped and stabbed himself with a frog gig. By the end of the day, the game wardens had written a hundred or so nuisance animal tags for hogs, gators, and deer, the idea being to remove as much of the local food source so that these monsters would move on when they got hungry. I didn't see any more of the hogman monsters, even though everyone knew that they had killed two female smaller monsters, suggesting that they had been breeding. The monster's bodies were confiscated by fish and game, and by the end of the day, it was alleged that the FBI got involved and took custody of the monster's bodies. That night, we had a fiesta. By noon the next day, the rednecks had sobered up enough to head home with some good stories, and things got back to normal. Till a few days later, the news was around that summer too, paying good money for monster pictures. Despite the rumor that it was really the FBI covering the whole incident up, everyone got paid well for these pictures, and no one had seen hide nor hair of the witch for a while. People tried to check on her, but the dogs chased them away. Eventually, by the end of the summer, the cops went there, and by this time, it was plain that the dogs were in a bad way. Once the dogs were taken away by animal control, the coroner called. The dogs had eaten the witch, and the cause of her death was most likely a brain hemorrhage, quotes. In the same place where Carl shot and stabbed the first hog monster, 
The Bruja was interred in the potter's field. Carl died two decades or so later and was interred in that same potter's field, right next to where the witch was buried. Mary then ends the story. So that was sent in to me, again, by Mutant Buzzard. So thank you for sending this in. I really butchered some of the Spanish words in it because I'm really terrible at pronouncing them. But I hope it didn't take away from the content. Uh, so I hope I could do it justice. Thank you for sending it in. So, what'd you think of those? Let me know which one was your favorite one down in the comments. Do you have one of your own? I have an email in the description below that you can send them to if you'd like to. In the description as well is a PayPal and a Patreon if you would like to support the channel that way. But, obviously, just watching the video, liking, subscribing, and commenting is really cool too. And with that, I think I will see you in the next one. So thank you for pulling up a stump, and thank you for watching. Have a good week.